Today, homeschooling veteran and author Phyllis Wheeler and homeschooling mom Sarah Bobel are here to prepare you for your next trip to the library. Today, we're going to look at a book that was published last year in 2020. It's called Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story. It's by Daniel Nairi. And afterward, we're going to get to interview the author, Daniel, and I'm very excited to meet him. Awesome. So, Sarah, does this book pass the good story test? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Phyllis, you're an author, so you know more about what components should go into a good story. But um, so Daniel, the author, is the narrator and the protagonist, and he's telling his story as part of a school assignment. And he was born in Persia in Iran, and he and his mother and sister became refugees. And you find out why in the book, which in and of itself is, it comes in the second half of the book, I believe. So it's, it's kind of hanging there for a lot of it. Um, and then eventually they settle in Oklahoma. So he becomes a refugee immigrant. And, um, you know, he has a lot of components that a lot of people don't experience. And people who are making up a story probably wouldn't include some of the things that happened to him that he talks about. Um, I think my favorite part is that he tells the story in a very different way. It's in the story and style of style of Persian storytelling. So I think a lot of the books that we read are like linear. It's, you know, goes from beginning to end. And this is not like that. There are no chapters. There's, you know, kind of breaks within the book. Like there's a, more space between sentences than in other sentences. But um, because of that, it just kind of feels like I finished the book in maybe three sittings, just like at some point I had to stop and put it down so I could do other things. Um, but you feel like, I felt like I was just being invited to sit and listen to like a, a tale, a yarn, you know, not, not just kind of read to find out what was happening or what the next action point was. So yeah, I think it passes the good story test. So tell me how it captures what it feels like to be the main character. He is, um, he gives amazing descriptions. So he talks quite a bit about food. Um, I think one of the reasons that it was fun to read is because it's being told from the perspective of, I think he's a fifth grader, a fifth grade boy. So it's just funny, like some of the things that he says and some of the things that are important to him. He talks um, a, a decent amount about poop, which uh, don't let that detract from kind of the seriousness of the rest of his life. Um, but he talks about, how much he loves his mom's cooking and it's very descriptive like I feel like I can like picture the the house that he lived in in Iran and you know see the the animals and the glass and the the plants and he when he talks about when he describes things there's just so much detail that you feel like you can smell those things almost and they're they're bright to you um but like a lot of the concerns he has are also pretty normal so I think some of the the common themes there are just being misunderstood as an immigrant. He's the only non-white kid in his class. Um, and he, he brings that up like right up at the front, um, like a desire to be known. And you can tell that in his storytelling, like he wants people to know who he is and where he's from. He's not just this, you know, weird looking kid from another country who landed in Oklahoma. Like he has a history and a life and his history is not just the span of his life, but like the span of his his culture of all of the Persian, you know, history. Um, so he, 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 I think he does a really good job of dealing with that in the way a kid that age would, like coping with loss and um, wanting some kind of redemption without knowing that that's what it's called, but just like hoping for it and longing for it. Um, yeah, so all those things are woven in there, but I really, really enjoyed a lot of the descriptions of he talks about Persian rugs, there's one section and just um, like you kind of get a real feel for how intricate these, these uh, they are. And um, there was something, oh, like some, some of the animals, there's one, I, this is a point of discernment if you have a sensitive kid or a kid who's sensitive to animals being hurt. Um, there was a, a bull being slaughtered in the beginning and it was very, very, vivid like you could kind of you know feel the worry of the people around that were dealing with this bull um so i think he does a great job with with that using descriptions so what about the the emotional ride 
that you go on when you read this book? Is it pretty intense or not really? Um, I think considering some of the events that he's experienced, it's not, it seems like he's processing it in a way that a middle grades student would, not an adult who's kind of thinking about it after the fact. Um, I mean, he definitely has like anger, but it's not, um, it's, it's more of like an innocent, I'm, I'm dealing with this the first time and I'm confused because I don't know why these things are happening rather than, um, you know, I've read some books for kids in this grade level and um, the narrator is supposed to be a 12 year old, but they have this like mature perspective that they don't really have, you know what I mean? So, but I think in this book, he um, he's still the main character, the narrator still maintains a lot of innocence as he's talking about some of these, some of the harder things, um, especially like with his, with his mother and some of his experiences in the classroom, um, like being, being misunderstood and being bullied and things like that. I I uh, read part of this book and I recall a uh, a scene involving uh, a, a Miami Dolphins hat. You remember that one? Um, I remember the hat, but I don't remember why he got it. Oh, was this in the refugee camp? No, it was in Oklahoma, and his good friend gave it to him, and then these bullies just because Miami Dolphins were not popular apparently in among people in Oklahoma. So he immediately got bullied for it and he really didn't uh, understand what the mm -hmm. deal was. Didn't get it at all. Yeah. It's kind of very sad. It made me sad. So, so are there any other discernment situations that, that you uh, would flag for a Homes, general homeschooler? Yeah, I am. Um, so my daughter is almost nine and I probably won't have her read this until she's like 11 or 12. There is, a, so his mom and his sister, the three of them moved to the U.S. without, without his dad. And um, she remarries and his stepfather is actually physically abusive. Like he talks about how his stepdad broke his mom's jaw. Um, from punching her. And so that, that probably is the biggest reason I, I was hesitant to have my kid read it. Just, I don't think she would understand that because she's growing up in a different environment where like people don't do that. Um, I'm not, I don't know that I'm ready to, for her to know that things like that happen um, at eight, nine years old. So there's that. Um, and there's also a scene where the church he goes to is portrayed in kind of a, not a great way. The, um, the pastor of the church counsels his mother to um, not divorce her husband, her abusive husband, because he asked for forgiveness. And so she keeps, I think it was three times she, um, they got back together and, you know, separated and got back together because of kind of the guilt that she felt about divorce and, you know, every time it happened, she just got beat up again. And um, yeah, so there's, there's kind of, there's that. And those two things, and I think the, maybe for some kids, the description of the bull being slaughtered might be um, hard, hard for some people to read or to understand if they're not, you know, if they're not accustomed or aware that things like that happen. So it sounds like it might be more useful for, say, a 14-year-old than a 12-year-old. Yeah, yeah, I guess this might have gotten classified as a middle grades book because the author, the um, the narrator is a fifth grader. Um, I think in some of the reviews that I've read, people said that, you know, it's a book for, it's a book for adults, but it's a kid's book, but it's not. And so I kind of agree with that. I think... I think my, I think, you know, the 12 year olds that I know could read it and enjoy it and follow the story and, you know, develop sympathy for the character um, and maybe see themselves somewhere in the book as well. So 
but yeah, definitely a high school kid would not be bored by the book or, you know, would they wouldn't think that it was babyish or anything like that, in my opinion. So, so overall, how many stars do you give it? I gave it five out of five. It was, I think it was the last book that I read in 2020. And maybe because I remember it the best, it was definitely one of my favorite books that I read that year. It was just, um, you know, for especially the, the other thing that I value about it is when, when I was in elementary school, I grew up in a very, um, you know, suburban town and even in a predominantly white suburban town, my classroom had like a somewhat of a mix of kids. Like I remember there were some Russian girls and um, a Chinese student and me, and um, there's only like, you know, one of each thing, other thing, but um, like for homeschool kids, you just kind of, a lot of homeschoolers just don't meet immigrants or um, even necessarily other people of other races or um, ethnicities. So just to be able to read about a culture that's so different and even like, you know, I'm probably never gonna get to go to Persia and sit with someone and listen to a story. Um, so to just be able to experience that, I thought was really cool since I'm like a quasi Charlotte Mason um, homeschooler. This to me was a living book about Persian, Persian culture slash the refugee immigrant experience um, and so I, I enjoyed reading it. I thought the story was, was great and, and fun and funny, but also, like you said, really sad. I mean, it just really rang true to the experience of life where, you know, even when redemption comes for him, for Daniel towards the end, it's not complete. It's not, um, 100% satisfying, but that's, you know, that's life. So I appreciated that as well. It wasn't like a, you know, everything is awesome at the end, just because this one thing that I was hoping to happen happened. Um, yeah, that's my, my take. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we just talked a little bit about your book, Daniel, before you came on, but Daniel is here right now, um, the author of the book, Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story. Um, and we're gonna ask him some questions about the book um, for the homeschooling parents out there. So if you've seen the trailer, then you know that Phyllis and my goal with this YouTube channel is to um, have kids who not, they're not just reading Anne of Green Gables, which everyone knows is a great middle grades book, but since there's new great books being written all the time, we want to um, find the ones that are most recently published and awesome and um, bring them to you. So without further ado, here's our interview with Daniel Nairi. I think Phyllis is gonna ask the first question. <laughs> oh, I'm wondering, Daniel, why did you start writing this book? Oh, that's a good question. Well, um, so, you know, when I came to the United States, I was, uh, I, you know, I was a young, I was a young kid. I was, I was seven and eight, kind of roughly, and just going into second grade. And we were refugees. We we landed in Oklahoma, and we were refugees from Iran. And so, um, if you can imagine, at that time in the early '90s, um, a lot of people, when I would go, you know, in playgrounds or anything like that, talking to my my friends' parents. Um, you end up answering one particular question a lot, which is, what are you doing here? Like, why, why, is, uh, why are you and your mother and your sister here while your, you know, your father's back in Iran, your whole family's back in Iran, everything you know uh, is there. And so to answer, what are you doing here as a, just a general question, it's such a big question, especially to answer um, when you're eight and all you want to do is like play soccer with, your, <laughs> with this person's child, um, you sort of want to try to figure out how to answer that question as quickly as possible. So I used to uh, go into the answer in a hundred different ways. Um, honestly, it was, um, I think of as my first uh, interaction with story editing, where the facts were the same, but I would tell it really quickly if I wanted to get out of there, or I would, you know, tell the only the funny parts, or sometimes only the action-oriented parts, or um, I really mm -hmm. uh, found new ways of telling it over and over again. So, um, so in some ways, it was sort of my first, my first uh, work as a storyteller. It was the first time I fell in love with telling stories, and and so I sort of knew that 
going to college for writing. Um, it was always the book, the, you know, the book of my family story that I was working toward. I had written a lot of other stories. I'd written a lot of different projects, films, but, but this one was always the one. This one was the one that was going to be dedicated to my mom. It was the one that um, kind of was my family journey. And so, um, so yeah, it was the it was the first story I ever told, and it, it was absolutely going to be the big one. Um, and then finally, so I've been, as you can imagine, out of the second grade for quite a while. So <laughs> it took a minute to write. <laughs> so. so I I loved reading your book. Um, the fact that it didn't have chapter separations made me read really large chunks of it at a time, like more than I actually had time for. Um, but like part of the, what, one of the things that makes your book different is the way you tell the story and kind of like the Persian storytelling, um, way. And I love that introduction to, to Iranian Persian culture. Um, so like more specifically, I was wondering as your story kind of unfolds, um, and you're trying to be like understood and known by these people in Oklahoma, like your classmates, the Jareds and Kellys and Brandons which I thought was really funny because it's just such like a, like a, like a 90s era <laughs> group of people. And I, so I know Jared's and Brand Brandon's and Kelly's too, um, but like they're the age of your, you know, your audience or the audience for this book. So um, I was just wondering if you had any, if you had those people in mind as you were writing, like if there's just broadly anything you um, want that audience to know about like, being an immigrant or a refugee um yeah like did you did you think about think about those specific people as you were writing um and what like is there anything you wanted to kind of communicate more broadly than you know your specific story you can say sure. no sure <laughs> um well let me let me ask a question before i go into it so i answer the right question do you mean and was i thinking about my contemporaries at that time who are all now turning 40 or do you mean the just what was i thinking when i mean when i was writing for young readers now yes the second part the second one. Oh, so yeah absolutely so one of the things that's really important to me is and you know you we can disagree um on where the line is, but one of the things that's very important to me is to actually um, be very child-centered, right? I didn't write this for an adult audience. I initially wrote it um, that way, but I made that choice. Um, I'm also a publisher, uh, you know, and so I edit a lot of children's books as well. So uh, yeah, I very much wanted to think about um, a, a kid audience, a child audience at the same time. So I, I hold that in one hand, this idea of being appropriate for the age, being sort of meeting them emotionally where they are, um, trying to not only explain everything from a first principles uh, perspective, but also to, you know, walk them along the, the path, not to make any assumptions. At the same time, I hold on in this hand, um, what I would consider an understanding of kids that they are just as intelligent as adults, just far less informed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a phrase we use a lot. I use a lot as well. I, I think emotionally they're capable of incredibly complex, um, and frankly, just as complex um, uh, emotion sets as adults. They are certainly, certainly less informed, and they certainly do not as um, strong a tool set to deal with these kinds of emotions. And so, um, so no, I did not. I absolutely did not want to write a book that. Um, you know, was like catharsis for the writer, but a burden mm -hmm. for the reader. Yeah. Um, that That is, so to emotionally burden a kid seems, well, frankly, it just seems truly unjust, but, and also um, truly unwelcome. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so where do you get, you're talking to other people's kids. Um, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, that's, that's a very real um, uh, uh, privilege, but it's also a very real uh, obligation mm -hmm. to, to handle properly. I did undeniably want to, however, without giving them that burden, um, help them to start building tools in order to process what are very clearly going to be universal burdens in everyone's life. Everyone has to deal with what we might call the traumatic experience of growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it won't probably be a refugee camp, but it will be something. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think a lot about 
the kid audience. Um, yeah. And, you know, where I said we might disagree with where the line is, it's like, I, I you know, this is where you hope uh, you've done a good job, you know, uh -huh. but the, the goal has, has absolutely that. Yeah. I was very really interested in this, uh, I, I forget what you called it, it started with a T, where you, you keep saying, uh, you know, it's my fault. No, it's my fault. No, it's my fault. Or just oh, tar off. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tar off? Is that what yeah, it was? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Like tar off. And you just kind of talk about how it's sort of pointless, but you have to do it. And yeah. and, and then there, there's the birthday dinner that couldn't be eaten because of it. Could you explain that to our listeners a little bit? <laughs> sure. Um, so, you know, in every, in every sort of culture, when you're trying to explain explain your culture to sort of outsiders there's always there's always like certain pillars of a culture you have to explain in in books about iran i find it personally really funny because every author iranian author who has to explain our culture will have to have a section on the on this word tarof um and i, I always love reading novels by them and trying to see what their definition is because it's one of these you know um real differences between that and say like in the west if i was talking about like if i was trying to explain america to someone who really didn't understand america one of the very first things i would try to explain is the cowboy way right like we have one of the great cultural definitions and exports of america is the cowboy way and and what does that mean well it means so much i couldn't even begin to express it it means being honest and upfront like not ever really avoiding conflict that's straightforward there's americans are very they're very straightforward they they um they're, they're very sincere group like, like the british often feel that our humor is really sincere whereas theirs is really sarcastic um another thing is like the do-it-yourself mentality of a country that frankly did it itself that's the cowboy way right so that's the, that's what i would consider in the west now in the east the sort of iran i would almost make the the counter example is tarof um not counter in the sense that it's opposite but counter is in it's also that important it's that massive to our culture and tarof is a form of politeness um, a form uh, of what I would sort of describe as like self-effacing in order to honor the person who you consider the guest. And Tarof comes from a culture of guest and host rights, right? So if you look back into like ancient uh, texts, um, there's a lot that's written about um, being gracious to your guests, you know, uh, and being, you know, for, you know, they might be angels for all, you know, um, but also being, um, being a good host, like what is your obligation to someone who is maybe just wandered through a difficult journey and needs water and needs sustenance needs to, you know, um, and you have a, you know, um, you know, a, a, an established say tribe. So all the way back, to that, you get this sort of established and layered cultural nuance in the form of Tarof, which is really in the form of saying, you are my guest. Um, and so uh, let's say in the, if we were going out to dinner in the modern uh, Iran, I'd be like, no, no, you know, it's my job to pay for you. I, it is you have paid by um, doing me the honor of your presence. And so I'm telling you that we are, I, we can only be, uh, uh, what is it, uh, in a just scenario if I pay for your food because you are, you know, the honorable one. And of course they would say the same and you go back and forth and we never figure out how you, who pays for the meal. <laughs> Uh, and it takes 40 minutes. <laughs> and this is like a perfect, the who pays for the meal is a really good example of Tarof because it's where it comes, but it happens all over the place. And it's it's a very much um, uh, uh, built on how to be polite in Iran. And it's it's way of saying, you know, sort of lifting um, someone else up and, and mm -hmm. you know, giving them respect. It's very much a um, respect-based culture. Did that answer the question? It's such a yes. broad question. It's like saying, explain America. It's like, I can't. <laughs> but I tried. I, I, I gave you both America and Iran. So did a great yeah, job. That was great. great. Good job. <laughs> Korea has something like that, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think polite systems all over the world are always a fascinating thing um, to, to study. Right. Well, I was telling yeah. Phyllis before we started that probably my favorite line from your book was the one where you were describing yourself as the dust on somebody's shoe and just please don't let me make you sneeze 
like <laughs> so self-effacing. <laughs> I laughed really hard when I read that. It was perfect. <laughs> A perfect description. Yeah. Those um, are the kinds of sentences you actually see in, uh, you know, like sort of the travelogues. Of, you know, oh, really? It's real? Oh, my gosh. They're, yeah, yeah. There's sentences that you're just like, what? <laughs> what <do you> say? <laughs> but the, yeah, um, most honorable. Yeah, the, there's some great sections of the Arabian oh. Nights where people will describe the other in such over the top grandiose ways that um, it's really charming. I think. Okay. I thought you made it up to be funny. I was oh, I, I mean, I made <laughs> up that ever. particular description was <laughs> mine, but the, the construct of being yeah. like, I mean, in to Americans, it's actually like, I think we would probably call it obsequious, right? It's a little yeah. too suck up for it to be, um, for it to kind of be taken seriously. But yeah, it's in, that, that construct happens, uh, especially in like the Arabian Nights where someone is speaking to a uh, queen or a king. It's like how, how it's done. <laughs> Was, um, you talked about the Arabian Nights or in your book, you called it the 1001 Nights in your book. It, it, it kind of provided a lot of structure. Was that the main source of structure for your storytelling? Um, it was a part, absolutely. Um, so, you know, traditionally, the, uh, the structure of the Arabian Nights is fascinating because it's got two sort of really, um, two like characteristics that most stand out. There's a lot of characteristics, but two, one of them is what we would call the nested story. So, mm -hmm. um, and some people call that the Chinese box narrative and some people call it the Arabian Nights narrative. Um, and the Chinese box being like a box that's in a box that's in a box. Um, and the reason for that is cl clear because it's like Sherazad will tell a story about a um, fisherman who finds a genie in a bottle at sea who then, uh, the, the the genie comes out and he says, um, if you don't tell me a story, I'll kill you. So he then tells a story about these three princes who are sitting around and then one of them decides to tell a story and you start to see it going all the way in and it comes all the way out. That's one structure that absolutely you see in this book in a much more simple um, construction that's from the Arabian Nights. And another is this like uh, sudden sharp endings of sequences in what we would call like cliffhangers. And the reason for that is, well, Sherzad was trying to stay alive. She was telling a story to a king mm -hmm. and every night um, she wanted to end on a place where he would be so enticed to hear the rest that he would keep her alive for one more day. So the phrase is, um, it's always, uh, and then the sun or the light of the sun, the light of the rising sun came through the window and, and Sherzad lapsed into silence. And so, and that happens like in the weirdest places, <laughs> It'll happen, but it happens in the place of like most interest. Those two are pretty characteristic of Arabian night uh, storytelling. And, you know, I try to touch them. Um, but the thing, the other text that's really important are, is probably the, the Shahnameh, which is, it's like, um, it's like our, the Odyssey, right? The, the, what we would call the national epic of Persia, before it, it's really important because before the Islamic conquest, um, you have this you have this writer who um, Ferdowsi, right? Who he's he's not he's writing after the conquest, but shortly after, and you can see that his project is to like record all of the mythology and legend and even the history of the kings up until the Islamic conquest as almost a a way of keeping a chronicle of. Persia. Um, this is really important because like, like my father will tell you, why do all the countries that were taken over, like Egypt, why do Egyptians don't speak Egyptian, they speak Arabic? Why do Syrians don't speak Syrian, they speak Arabic? And he said, and to him, like, but Persians, they were also conquered by the Islamic conquest, but they don't speak Arabic, they speak Farsi. Why? Mm -hmm. The reason is this book. Like he says, the reason that Ferdowsi wrote such beautiful poetry in Farsi that Iranians had to remember it in order to keep reading this book, right? This is, of course, mythologizing it a little bit, but it's not that far off. It's a very, very important text to Iranians. And, and of course, and part of that is because it, has, it, it allows them, it allows a distinct culture maybe before and after. And so mm -hmm. that the kind of quote before time, um, it had a lot of characteristics that I like, right? I mean, just think about how I said it. He's trying to remember. And in this book, he's trying to chronicle the history of his family 
so that he can remember it because the before time he lived with them and had a family and lived in Iran in the after time he's a refugee kid who's sort of poor and lives in Oklahoma and fundamentally like doesn't have his culture anymore he has a new culture and it's a good one um but he doesn't he's like he starts to have that uh what do you call it preoccupation with not forgetting uh and that's you know that's it's clearly tied to his father, who's also there. So it's clearly tied to just wanting to hold on to people you, uh, people you love. So um, the Shah Nama ends up being another uh, important text, I guess you'd say, to this book. I love the way it was written. I really enjoyed Thanks. reading it. And I was telling Phyllis, since we're like quasi Charlotte Mason homeschoolers, um, oh, cool. one of the hallmarks of Charlotte Mason homeschooling is living books. Like I would so much prefer that my kids read your book than read any other description of Persia <laughs> or <you> know, <laughs> Iranian history or even, they can do that oh. stuff later, but like for the suck them in and get them, you know, get them interested and have like a real picture of it for someone was like your book is it. <laughs> oh, well, thank, thank you. That's that's a really kind thing to say. I haven't I seen any others options, but yeah. That's <laughs> okay. I'll be one, one out of one is fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a proud man. I'll take whatever, whatever prize there is. <laughs> it was great. Oh, thank you. Goodness. It's really funny. I should say my, my wife and I have been homeschooling our son and we, it's also a fairly a literature based one too. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. I love, I love that he's reading just so much more, uh, you know, and, and a great insight into these things. Awesome. Did you have any other questions, Phyllis? Oh, I don't know. I think we've probably talked long enough here. So that's... Uh, okay. Um, I just had one more yeah. um, question. So one thing that I really appreciated about your book was that um, like the redemption came from like a kind of an unlikely place, um, like your dad visiting the classroom and and your sister. Um, but since your book took place in the real world, it was like a partial redemption, like things got a lot better, but there was still like a path of, you know, difficulty because it was, you know, real life. Um, and I thought that was like a real encouragement for the reader. So I was wondering if that was like, were you just kind of telling it like it is? Or was that intentional? Um, I didn't know if that's like a storytelling thing that writers do. Those would probably <laughs> know he writes. But, yeah. Um... Well, I mean, it's sort of the way it is. I mean, it's how I perceive how, perceive how these things happen. Um, but I think also, um, I, I think it's also just more helpful in the sense that, you know, I've, I have read books where the author sort of puts their hand on the scale a little bit at the mm -hmm. end. And you're like, oh, gosh, it seemed like cheap, a cheap victory, so to speak, or a cheap yeah. forgiveness even. There's times where, um, and forgiveness is, is extremely expensive. Um, redemption is extremely expensive. Um, expensive in the sense of there is there is extreme cost to all this stuff. Um, and I did not want to bur again burden the young reader with um, the extremity of that, you know. Um, but but in the book, it's actually really interesting. It, it tries to talk about this paradox as well. It says like you're kind of more you know you're you're guilty that you're more guilty than you kind of think. Um, guilty of good that you didn't do, guilty of plenty of bad that you have done, but you're also, you know, sort of more loved than you might uh, bear hope as well. So mm -hmm. um, it's clearly trying to um, not not disrespect the redemptive aspect of it or the the forgiveness aspect, the hopeful part, um, by making it candy, by making mm -hmm. it sort of really light and easy to get. That's not what it is. And by the way, that's not really satisfying as far as I'm concerned. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not like I would not I would not like glory in the like well all right it's all done simple simple as that and I and I, I was hoping the kids would, would anyone any reader would um, would value that more than yeah. if he had like if some if, if like I don't know publishers clearinghouse had showed up and handed him a million dollars it's like okay great like that didn't what do you it's just not real it's not a real life um but there was a great deal of um you know what's the best way redemption is probably the best way to put it and he did yeah. um and I and I'm, I was really excited you know I'm, I'm I was excited to have that be the, the ending. you know there's a moment where he says um 
uh, what is it? He quotes, uh, shoot, who does he quote? The guy who did Citizen Kane. <laughs> Orson Welles. Thank you. It's so late. It's <laughs> the end of the day. I'm sorry. Uh, there's a quote where he says, you know, the ending depends on where you, uh, where you decide to stop uh, the story, mm -hmm. right? And so he, he clearly wants to stop at that moment and say, okay, this is the entirety of this arc ends in this moment. And, and yes, life is going to go on and more difficulty is going to happen and also more joy and more sort of satisfaction of uh you know long held hopes and things like this but mm -hmm. here is an important place to close this book uh, so um that's that's where we so we did it yeah cool thank you so much um i really Thanks. appreciate you also talking about kind of your writing process i think that's really helpful for um, you know, parents who might listen to it and listen to this interview and um, kind of are talking briefly about your book beforehand um, to know what their kids are reading. Um, you know, in middle grades books, they just get longer. So it's harder for parents to pre-read. Yeah, so sure. they just stick with what they know. So um, we are happy, more than happy to put this out there to whatever audience amasses for us. So for that potential audience, if you're interested in learning more about or hearing more reviews on current books, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, during our next episode, Phyllis will be talking about The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise, which was published in 2019, so still fairly new. Um, until then, that's all from us. We wish you a happy and productive trip to your library or your Amazon bookstore. <laughs>